Hello, and welcome to my leadership series. I'm Elizabeth Suarez, a leadership and negotiation strategist who works with organizations, executives, and professionals to enhance leadership, negotiation, and conflict resolution skills, resulting in a more profitable, inclusive, and productive workplace. The intent of this leadership series is to spotlight industry leaders from across the world on their managerial style and leadership experience. In today's video, I'm spotlighting Amy Young. Amy Wong, the co-founder and COO of Hong Kong-based AQ Talent Lab, an organization which serves employers and employees in recruitment, career development, and training. Amy, welcome. Thank you. Hi, Elizabeth. Here. Thank you, Elizabeth, for having me. It, it's such a great honor. Well, thank you so much. So let's get the conversation going. And I want to start with something from your past. So sure. tell me, Amy, where were you raised and what college did you go to and what did you study? Cool. So I am actually born and bred in Hong Kong. Um, I've basically been in Hong Kong all my life, except for uh, my uh, college years where I did my bachelor's degree in Sydney, Australia. So, you know, when I when I uh, graduated high school, I kind of didn't really know what I wanted to do. So I went for basically the most generic uh, 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 degree that I could think of, which was a business degree. Um, and in the end, I majored in finance and business law because I felt like that would probably be, you know, something that could be useful down the road, uh, you know, whatever I choose to pursue. So what was your first time, first full-time job with this degree? Interesting. So my first time job ever was uh, I worked in B2B sales at Oracle in Sydney. Oh, so, and I've never been in sales before. So that was really like just diving into the, the workforce, like nose first. So that was a very uh, intense, but fun uh, first job for me. So with that job, did that job help you discover your passion or your capability for leadership in business? Um, I think it inspired me definitely I wasn't at that job for too long I was only there for three months before I moved back to Hong Kong but I definitely uh, benefited a lot from great uh, you know teammates and leaders who were you know because we were in the sales team so people were very charismatic mm -hmm. um, they were very good at influencing people in you know achieving uh, you know team targets achieving a goal as a, as, as, as a, as a team so definitely yeah I think that in, in the people that I met there definitely inspired me a lot. So, you know, starting your career in sales, that is something that really molds uh, individuals, leaders like yourself. So, so how would you define leadership? I'm just mm. curious because starting in sales and now doing what you're doing, how do you define that term? Um, I think there are two parts to leadership. One is just from a very, you know, business standpoint, just basically strategically setting out goals and basically having the business acumen to say, okay, this is what we want to achieve. So there's a goal setting part. Mm -hmm. um, and the second part, uh, like I mentioned, would be the influencing part. How do you influence and motivate your team so that we're, you're steering the ship and we're going together in one direction? Um, and I think now, especially when, uh, you know, the world is about diversity and inclusiveness, how do you get actually gather people from very different backgrounds with different skill sets, um, you know, basically uh, putting together uh, a, a, a super team, uh, something that's lean, something that's effective, um, and then achieving uh, business targets. So, you know, it's interesting that you mentioned inclusiveness because we all have lived it. You know, I mean, 2020 has become the year, we know, the pandemic was the year of the pandemic. It was also the year a lot of social arrest and also uh, social justice and yeah. racial tensions. And yes. a lot, uh, I live in the United States, I know you're in Hong Kong. A yeah. lot of it was here in the United States, but I know throughout the world, it was also present. And I feel working with the organizations I've been working for, uh, with for the past several years is that there is a mandate about inclusive leadership within organizations. Yeah. So I wanted to figure out what's your opinion on the subject of inclusion in the workplace? I think for me, it's always been 
um, pretty easy to think about inclusiveness because especially the industry that I'm in, I'm in uh, digital content, I'm in the tech side of things. So the people that we work with are usually, you know, they'd be millennials or they'd be younger. Okay. So I think inclusiveness is very much sort of like, um, uh, they're very aware of it uh, and it, it's kind of ingrained in their own beliefs. Uh, but I do think that it does, uh, as, especially in a managerial role or in a leadership role, you do have to make it a point that, you know, and, and, and inclusiveness is, 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 there's a very wide definition. It's just in, in terms of, you know, in your day-to-day -day team meeting or communication with people, how do you make them feel um, you know, uh, 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 cultivate an inclusive environment. And more than that, how do you empower people? I think that's a huge part of inclusive. You're not just part of the conversation, you're a pillar to this company. So how do I give people a voice? How do I make you feel like, yes, I can do this. And this is the place where I can. The part of inclusiveness that I, I'm really um, sort of focused on uh, uh, as, a, as a leader. So, a leader like yourself and somebody that embraces inclusiveness and you view it like an empowerment and you also view it like a strong influencer and a major pillar uh, for any leader. Um, in your opinion, what is the biggest challenge a leader like yourself faces in leading diverse organizations? Yeah. First of all, I think we're pretty lucky living in Hong Kong. We've always been kind of like a cultural melting pot. So I think diversity is also part of a huge advantage that Hong Kong has as, as, as a, you know, a, a market. But mm -hmm. I think in terms of challenges, I, I see that there are two. Number one is finding, you know, as a, as a leader or as a co-founder, finding a partner who share the same value. From day one, you would say, yes, we do want to make a big deal out of diversity. Uh, inclusiveness is important to us, right? Because if profits, revenue, that is your number one priority, then that's a very different conversation. But if from day one, we really want to cultivate, not only do we want this company to be successful, but we want to be known for being a diverse, uh, inclusive uh, work environment, uh, you need to find partners and investors who buy into that dream and, and that goal. The second part is, okay, now that you kind of have that intention and you have that environment, how do you really give people a voice? Because I think, uh, especially in Asia, a lot of people are used to assuming certain roles that you know society dictates so now that you're in an environment we say okay this is a level playing field how do you make them feel comfortable to come out of their shell uh, how do you make them feel like yes i'm part of this conversation and i want to be able to speak freely i want to have the courage to speak mm -hmm. freely about you know my ideas or what i uh, can contribute to the to the company so um there, there are two sides of it like setting the tone and then also giving people a voice to make them feel like yes like it's okay for me to, to speak up and and, and to to try different things. You know, I like how you say the setting the tone, which is so important, but then you take it to the next level of actually giving them the opportunity to voice their opinion. So yeah. can you give me an example on how you have been able to, you know, how have you been able to do that and been successful at it? Yeah. So I think in the beginning, because um, a little bit of background, I think as a company, we uh, make it a point to hire a lot of local young talent. Mm -hmm. So uh, because we're in digital and we want to do like really, you know, fun digital content that caters for uh, young professionals and university graduates. So we hire a lot of like, fresh graduates who don't have a lot of experience. Um, and sometimes when we bring them on, we want to be like, hey, yeah, tell me what you think. Like if you were to run this company, if you were to uh, basically set out the content strategy uh, for the next quarter, what would you do? And then a lot of them would feel uncomfortable. They'd be like, oh, you know, what you said was good or, um, uh, uh, you know, like what you guys have been doing is great. Like we should just keep going at that. And I would be like, no, no, no. Like I know you have more. Like I know that you have ideas because we are marketing this app and this platform for people exactly like you. So tell me, like, what, what do you, what do you think? Like you really have to um, basically encourage them and empower them to think a little deeper. Like I know in the past, you know, you haven't been in a position where you can speak about your ideas or uh, uh, run with an idea freely. Um, but let me just 
reassure you that this is environment. You're hired for a reason. Uh, let me reassure you that you're here because we value your experiences and your talent, uh, you know, uh, as a fresh graduate. Um, so yeah, let, let me know what you think. And it takes time and it takes mm -hmm. a level of trust, obviously. It doesn't happen from day one. Uh, but when you do see uh, you know, your uh, new teammates or your young employees really like coming out of their shell and be like, no, actually, Amy, I think we could be doing better if we did X, Y, Z. Mm -hmm. That is uh, extremely valuable. Um, and I think that's when the magic happens. You know, and uh, a lot of employers should be thankful to you because you're taking that young generation, the newcomers coming into the business world, and you're really molding them, if you ask exactly. me. Exactly. I mean, and, and they are so much needed because I know college education is important, but really experience is extremely important. Absolutely, because I think thinking back, uh, my first few jobs, you know, in Oracle and, in, and I worked in banking for a little bit after that, the managers that I had in those uh, organizations, these people ultimately shaped my work ethic, uh, you know, thereafter. So I don't take, when I hire young, um, uh, uh, you know, university uh, graduates, um, I am very aware that I have the obligation to groom them because ultimately how I set the tone and how I uh, basically uh, interact with them would, uh, would shape their work ethic and how they feel about a work environment. Um, so I do, even between me and my partner, like I, I make it very, I make it a point to say that like we, we have an obligation to shape these people's you know, work ethic. So during the pandemic that we're still living, um, leaders had to virtually reinvent the way they conduct business. And yeah. I know that you're still with working with the younger generation and everything, but what were some of the actions you and your partner had to institute in your organization in order to make it work? I mean, many yeah. organizations, unfortunately, have vanished now, but yours is still standing and going forward and everything. So what was it that you have to institute in order to make this work? So I think, I think we spoke a little bit about this before, Elizabeth, but um, the lucky thing for us is that because we're a startup, uh, when we started uh, last summer, um, uh, we were uh, a very, very, we were very minimalistic setup. So it was me in a co-working space and everybody else that we engage, whether it be a consultant, a designer or development team, they all had to work remotely. Oh, okay. um, so this, Mobility has been in our DNA from day one. And then later came the social unrest in Hong Kong and then came the pandemic. So uh, we're very lucky that, you know, intrinsically when we first started this company, um, we were all very used to working remotely. Well, having said that, you know, coming from an institutional background, um, it wasn't easy for me because I'm very much like, um, I, I need to work with people face to face. I needed that like rapport and that connection. So in the beginning, it definitely wasn't easy. But I think there are um, two sides, uh, 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 two things that we've learned that made it a lot easier. Number one, you need to have the right people. Um, because if you, you know, during the interview process or onboarding process, if you feel like this person um, is, is um, uh, uh, very entrepreneurial, like they give you a lot of new ideas. They're very good at managing their own times and very good at um, basically working out their own little tricks and ways to make things work. That's a positive signal. And then the opposite would be sometimes, you know, you interview people who are like, oh, I'm looking for your input, your idea. You just give me instructions and I'll do it. Mm -hmm. That in our particular setting may not be um, compatible. Mm -hmm. So that's been the experience. So from the, from the interviewing, the, the onboarding process, that, that, that has been uh, very valuable for me to pick up those things and be like, yes, this person would work well with the mobility setup that we have. Um, and no, maybe this candidate would be better off in a, in a more traditional environment. Um, and the second part of it, it really is, you know, we're, especially with the pandemic, we're all taking it one day at a time. So you have to set very clear goals on a daily and weekly basis. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm not talking about micromanaging them, but let's say we have touch points every Tuesday and fi Friday. Tuesday, we set up what we do during the week. Friday, you just update me. So that everybody is very clear uh, what they have to do and their checkpoints uh, you know, uh, along the week where you let me know uh, if you have any challenges or any setbacks. And then we, as a team, 
we uh, try to fix that and we try to address it. If, if we have, if we're having a good week, uh, everything is on point, and we're we're meeting our targets every week, then then that's great. Uh, but the checkpoint really is there for uh, people to reach out if they have any challenges or if they have any concerns with the resources that they have, uh, and then we kind of address that as a team. So I like your approach. It's very, uh, very methodical and also very transparent and at the same time gives them lead way on how to complete it. So yes. now let, let's look post pandemic. Mm -hmm. What do you see as some of the key opportunities that lie ahead for businesses? Um, I think there are honestly so many. Um, I think before, especially in, uh, 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 I'm not sure about the States, but in Hong Kong, mm -hmm. or especially in Asian culture, a lot of businesses, like, I mean, I still know a lot of, you know, my business counterparts who prefer meeting face to face. They prefer working with organizations who they know and trust. Mm -hmm. uh, but as but with the work, the line of work that I'm in, in the digital tech space, like people are more um, a, a, a receptive to uh, cross-border partnerships, uh, engaging global uh, partners, because now it's like, well, I'm not gonna be able to meet uh, developers or partners face to face in Hong Kong, anyways. So why don't I encourage? Why don't I, you know, engage with someone in Sri Lanka? Why don't I engage with someone from the states, especially from a, you know, a, a content uh, production standpoint? Now with you know all these new platforms and new uh, uh, technologies, you you you're, you can build trust and really open the dialogue with people who are from a totally different time zone and continent. So I think that uh, would be very, very interesting. Um, the second thing is, I think, training and learning. I think a lot of corporate training and learning in the past has been very much like face-to-face, -face, like let's all fly to Florida for four yeah. days for like a retreat or the seminar. Now it's about like, how do we really make use of the uh, Zoom or, or, or webinar setup and make the most out of training and learning? Because people are more receptive to Learn, online learning these days. I think before it, it's very hard for them to imagine, but but COVID has really transformed our uh, learning and communication behavior into you know yeah it's okay to 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 have this conversation online. It's okay to learn and get training done online. Exactly. So conversely, because I mean you you did show a lot of the silver lining that many of us have seen with uh, yeah. uh, the pandemic world. But what are some concerns that you have observed that we need to pay attention in order to be effective leaders now with the post pandemic that we're starting that next um, stage? Absolutely. Uh, I think there are two things. One, um, it's the uh, it's the building trust and rapport aspect because mm -hmm. I do feel like even just in a in a in a a uh, Zoom call, Zoom, you know, a uh, conference kind of setting, people are just very eager to just get all the agenda, yeah. uh, you know, just check that off the list and then, okay, bye, have a great day. There's no um, rapport, there's no human connection. Like, you know, Elizabeth, how's your day been? You know, how, how's your family? Um, I think I'm feeling like there's less and less of that. And especially for me, I'm someone who is really relationship and, you know, can, human interaction driven. Um, I feel like that's that's missing. Okay. Right. So I think going forward as a society, uh, we need to think about like, how do we go about building trust or do we actually need to make more of an effort to be human? Like, can I be the first person to go like, hi, like, how are you doing? You know, how are the kids? Um, how's your week been? You know, just, just really make that extra effort. Mm -hmm. The second part of it uh, that I personally have a concern over is the, the mental health issue. Mm -hmm. I feel like, especially with the pandemic, a lot of people are thinking a lot about illnesses. We're thinking a lot about deaths. Um, and I do think that uh, we need to kind of tune in and pay more attention to, to mental health because I think, uh, it, well, we've been through a year of it in the beginning, like April uh, and July, you know, people have been very down, like morale has been very, very low. And, uh, you know, there are a lot of societal issues that came out from people kind of not paying attention to, to, to the mental health part. So business aside, I think um, we do need to um, work with experts and, and, and open dialogue about like, how do we, how do we address that? How do we make sure that we are pivoting in a completely new, you know, work mode, but 
we do it in a way that is uh, mentally and physically healthy. You know, I like uh, how you have uh, encapsulated everything concerning your leadership style and how you have led. The aspect of keeping it simple, the aspect of, uh, you know, sharing, this is the path we're going to take. But at the same time, the importance of seeing the human side, of taking yeah. care of that human side. And, and I'm glad to see this because this is one of the reasons why I've wanted to do this leadership series. I want to see how are leaders doing this? How, how are we going to go beyond the pandemic? So I appreciate you sharing all these great ideas. And also, I think there are, the young people that work for you are very lucky to have a leader like yourself that you're giving them the opportunity to explore and even make mistakes. I mean, you're, you're empowering them and hopefully they realize that they're gonna make mistakes, but they're gonna learn as they go forward. Absolutely. And, and, and I have to say, it's not easy because sometimes it's very counterintuitive when you have all these deadlines, you know, pressure from investors and um, a lot of things that you wanna get done, but then you have to kind of tell yourself, okay, hold on. Um, <laughs> are you okay? Like, are you, are, are, are we on the same page with things? And are you happy with what you're doing? Yeah. Is what we're doing helping you grow and, and, and feeding to your career aspirations? Because if you don't get that all cleared, um, along the way, there's going to be problems. There's not going to be, people are not going to be productive. Um, and you're going to have, a, you know, just more, more, more obstacles along the way. So sometimes it's, it feels counterintuitive to, to slow down and, 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 and stop and pause and have that conversation or have that lunch or, or coffee. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, I hope, and so far it has been working for us, I hope that that would pay off. Great point. So before we go, I have one more question for you, and especially that sure. you um, manage so many young leaders. Uh, I would ask you, what is the one key of advice you would share with a younger you. So you're graduating in Sydney, Australia from college. What piece of advice would you give to your younger you? Um, I would advise, I would really advise her, uh, her and, and everybody who's graduating, uh, dream bigger. Oh. Like even, even if you, thinking back, I feel like I would have accomplished a lot more if I had been um, greedier with what I want to achieve. If I dream bigger, like if I, if my goal back then was just to become a CEO, mm -hmm. I could have dreamed to, you know, become a CEO of a, uh, you know, a conglomerate or a, a, a you know, a, a, a global company. Um, or I would have dreamed to be a CEO and, you know, a, a creative person. So mm -hmm. don't be afraid to, to ask for more from yourself mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. honestly, you never know. Like now, the the timeline of which the young, young people are working with, the platforms that they have is completely different from before. So just don't be afraid to, to, to dream bigger. Great. I love that. I love that. That is great advice. Actually, I have a 20 year old and I will share that with her. So oh, thank you. Thank you. So, thank you, Amy, for your time. I also want to thank you for watching and I welcome your feedback on this topic. Comment below and let's continue the conversation. See you next time. Nos vemos.